My original intent was to cover Subject 2923 in its entirety as the final piece of DLC for Remnant. However, since the DLC effectively ends the story for the game, I thought it would be better to combine my thoughts on the base game as well as the DLC into one concise video. Since these two aspects should be evaluated as a singular whole for the purposes of measuring Remnant as a game, both from a story and gameplay perspective. As you can probably tell, this video is much longer than my average. There's a lot that I have to say when it comes to Remnant as a game, and I felt it would be an injustice to my critique if I left out anything for the sake of brevity or convenience. That being said, I've put timestamps below to separate the video into individual parts in case you want to know my thoughts on a specific aspect of the game. Of course, this is all my opinion, so if you don't like it, I mean, that's fine. That's what opinions are for. Obviously, there will be spoilers for everything. If you want my thoughts on 2923 as a DLC without spoilers, here's a link for that. You've been warned. Remnant from the Ashes is a game. In fact, it's like many other games you can find out there. It brings elements of Souls-like titles with its boss-heavy encounters and limited outward story. It has some RPG elements revolving around character leveling and skill improvements, and even some roguelike mechanics in the way it uses restricted randomization to add variety to each level and run. Yes, Remnant is like many other games out there. What it does has been done before in one form or another. But not in the same way. Stay with me here, but at the core of everything a player can do in Remnant is a very simple loop of play. Kill things, get stuff. It really sounds like I'm being overly simplistic, but in reality, this is the biggest motivator for a player to move forward. The story aside, and we'll get to the story. The primary drive of your character is to grow stronger and acquire more powerful items to defeat obstacles that stand in your way. From your very first moments in the game, you are imparted with the idea that your primary goal is to kill enemies in order to advance, which is pretty common. The game equips you with basic set of armor, a weapon, a mod, and then pushes you out into the world. Here's a gun, here's a melee weapon, here's a vague quest. That's it. That's all you need. And it all starts with the gunplay, which is the principal form of combat in Remnant. It's smooth and well implemented. Shifting from walking to shooting is done with a single command, and the weapon lock-on moves seamlessly as you aim, giving you the feeling of control and autonomy in combat. Each shot that you hit or miss is based on your ability to move and lock onto your target. The game is almost always responsive in the time that you need it to be, and so it takes no time at all for a new player to get the hang of the entire combat system. This makes the barrier for entry extremely low, to the point where it's almost non-existent. The first shot you ever take resonates back to the player with a message that says, this is simple, and simple is fun. Damage numbers fly across the screen, giving you feedback to your power and damage output and becoming yellow when crits are applied, or bright red and massive when a weak spot is hit on an enemy. It's a wonderful display and it instantly drives home the idea of growing more powerful just for the sake of having bigger numbers in the screen. The three starting weapons each encourage a different form of gameplay, based solely on what range they best perform at. This further emphasizes the comfort of the player over a more cumbersome system that would have you, say, pick a class with limitations to match a set playstyle. The best thing is that you aren't locked into any one of these, and pretty early on you can purchase the other two choices that you initially skipped out on and try them out to see if they suit you better. There are only three when you first start, but these offer enough variety and interchangeability among themselves that it doesn't feel limited, even though it is. You have the freedom to choose within the context of limitation the game imposes on you, and this is a trait that permeates the whole of Remnant. The game has a very select number of options to offer you. Whether it is a boss encounter, a reward, or a trait, there are only so many that you will experience regardless of how many times you play. This is a term that I'm going to coin as limited variety. I'm sure there's an actual term for this out there, I'm just going to use this instead because it makes me feel smart. Limited variety allows for the game to make each choice that is available to you be a meaningful one. You won't have an endless list of slightly different weapons or armor that all have adjusted stats, but you don't need to. Each item offered to you is designed to fit in its own niche playstyle that feels good to use and shines when used in the intended way. Each one has a specific and recognizable look and play to it. The way they fire, the reload speed, even how long it takes to aim, these are all characteristic that your gear possesses and it makes each one worth learning and growing accustomed to. There will come a time where you have a favorite weapon or armor. Maybe it's because of how it looks or just how it feels to play. 
but you will recognize it instantly when you use it as opposed to any other in the game. I started the game with the rifle and the hunter's armor, and that has been my primary set to this day. It's the one I've played most with, and it feels familiar and comfortable. They're not the most powerful item in the game, but I've beaten bosses with them more times than I have with more powerful gear. I play better because I'm using the things that I'm more comfortable with. Being able to establish that level of comfort and familiarity in your player is a great achievement that adds to the game feel. And having this limited set of options doesn't mean that it takes away from the established ability to customize your play. It just isn't infinite. Remnant is a game about builds and customization of gameplay. While your character remains mostly static in their power level and progression throughout the game, the items that you acquire in your adventures lend to a player's vast array of choices in how they want to interact with the environment. Each set of armor, each weapon, necklace, ring, and mod is a singular part of a complex and massive web of choices and opportunities for creativity. And that expands far beyond just the guns. If you want to create a build where you don a massive metal suit of armor and quite literally body slam your way through the encounters, you totally can. Shout out to Pickle in the community discord for coming up with this build. The game, again, offers you a complex set of decisions to make while maintaining the limited access to choices the player has. It works well to allow player agency within the context of how they want to approach their play experience. This same approach extends to the boss encounters, which are another aspect of Remnant that is done very well. Because the base combat system in the game is simple and easy to learn, the devs were able to create an almost mirrored effect in the way they challenge players through combat encounters. Like the gear, each boss brings a distinct experience to the player. No two fights are the same and no two bosses look or act alike. Each one stands singularly from any other, and so each time you face one, it becomes a new opportunity to learn and expand your skills. This is where the largest part of the game's enjoyment is found. Along with having several ways to customize your playstyle, you must test those customizations and your abilities against imposing opponents that will do their best to bring you down. You will traverse to a boss, fight it, learn how to defeat it, and eventually come up victorious. Doing so does not mean your character is necessarily more powerful, but rather that you as a player have become better at the game through practice and improvement. There is a tangible sense of your skills becoming better than when you started. This intrinsic reward system is one that feeds the motivation to continue forward through the game. The desire to continue to improve, to face the next challenge and overcome it, becomes your primary reward. The game then supplements this with extrinsic rewards of loot to solidify the enjoyment and thus the cycle is complete. Kill things, get stuff. Outside of this there are other aspects that also complement this core system, which allows even further ease of access to players who want to have the most out of their experience without spending needless time and moments between encounters. Due to the randomized nature of the level design, the game needed to have a concise and understandable way for players to traverse the environment. This starts with the level selection options, which allow any player who has visited an area in the main campaign to do so again as many times as they wish without the need to run through the main story multiple times. The benefits here are fairly obvious, especially for players who are seeking to complete a specific build or match themselves against a specific boss. The levels themselves are designed in a way that facilitates this style of play. Most of the areas are open and easy to traverse with enemies that don't really pose any type of challenge. The map is marked with the places you will know you want to go for boss encounters, and each one has an established formula for how many bosses you are likely to see, with few variations here and there to keep each run different from the last. However, here is where the weakness of using the system starts to show itself. Although limited variety is a solid base to build on an enjoyable and repeatable gameplay loop, it will eventually become a matter of just how limited it is. Because of the finite nature of Remnant, the game has a shelf life. At some point you will unlock all the gear, defeat all the bosses, and find every secret. Now this is by no means a problem unique to Remnant. Most games do eventually run out of things to do. That's sort of the point. The game delivers a set experience, and once you've completed it, you've reached the end. Despite the loot-focused appearance that Remnant presents, the game doesn't follow any of the big trends that other loot-based games possess. For one, the loot is mostly guaranteed. Aside from some items that drop in the world itself and not from bosses, there is no drop chance margin to worry about. If you fight a boss and they are meant to drop a specific item, they will do so. 
The only aspect of repetition that the game really offers is the fact that you must run a location multiple times to see every encounter that it has to offer and collect every bit of randomized loot that the world can present. It's a weird dynamic where the difficulty of obtaining something is placed on your chances of seeing it rather than it dropping from any particular source. It's streamlined and it allows players maximum experience with minimal downtime, while also increasing the longevity of the game to some degree by limiting the number of encounters a player can see in any given run. You start a run, go through the area, kill the bosses, rinse and repeat. You can run through several iterations of a particular zone if you're skilled enough and don't get stuck in a particular fight. This brings both positive and negative aspects. You'll be able to run through a place fairly quickly and see what it has to offer, but there is also a high chance that you will encounter some of the same fights more than once. This is especially true if you are seeking to fight a specific boss and the RNG just isn't on your side. It takes away from the experience quite a bit and adds an unnecessary level of frustration. But the game relies on this randomness loop to keep people playing since after the main story is over, there is nothing else to do except continue in the base loop. There is no reasonable endgame play aside from the appeal of trying different builds with the added gear and running new and higher difficulties. No reward system is in place to give the game longevity in any meaningful way, despite the solid gameplay loop that it has in place. Aside from survival mode, which rewards skin for armor pieces, there is no real incentive for a player to keep coming back and farming bosses other than to kill them in different ways. Whether this is an intended mechanic or not is hard to say. There are elements in the game that would point to it wanting to be a loot-focused experience that players can keep coming back to, but the game itself doesn't show any indications that this is an option. Some would consider this a downside. Players who like the established loop will eventually find themselves with nothing to do. There are only so many builds and times that you can face a boss in the hardest difficulty, and although the game offers plenty of permeations of this, eventually you'll do them all. If you're someone like me who doesn't enjoy endless grind games for arbitrary rewards, Remnant offers a finite but compacted experience. I can go through the game and feel like I've gotten a huge chunk of the content without endless hours of repeated grind. I can fight all of the bosses, collect the majority of the rewards, and gain a fully developed character that I can expand on and come back to if I wish to. As opposed to a game like Destiny or Diablo which relies on similar loot grinds in reaching endgame for the game to be enjoyable. Remnant delivers the entire experience from the get-go. You will go places, fight bosses, and gain loot. When the credits roll, you have gone through much the same experience as many other players. Whether this is what you want out of it or not, it's up to you, but it's important to venture into it with the right expectations. Remnant offers a familiar yet unique gameplay experience that fills in the role that it is trying to present rather well. However, there is an aspect of the game that I find severely lacking. I would like to emphasize that I think the world of Remnant is absolutely fascinating. The lore behind every event ties wonderfully together and leaves much for those that love story and a mystery to pour over and expand upon. I love the lore in the game. I literally have an entire playlist of videos dedicated to just that. I say this because I don't think the game does a good job showing off the story that it has to tell. The journey into the world of Remnant begins with little knowledge of what to expect. It's dark and mysterious. You are a traveler from another land, sent here by your people to vanquish a dragon that has brought darkness to the world. Soon you come to learn that there is much more going on than a mythical dragon in a world enveloped in darkness. Earth has been at war for many years against a fierce enemy known as the Root, who came here from another world. You soon meet Ellen, a woman who leads an underground surviving group. She tells you to find a man by the name of Commander Ford, who is the key to both your quest and humanity survival. All of this information is given to you within the first hour of play and it's the most information the game directly delivers to you, ever. As you move from Earth through the labyrinth into the other worlds beyond, you are never explicitly told a story. You simply move from world to world following the vague clues presented to you, all in a singular pursuit to find Commander Ford so that you may access the final area where your query resides. The world does not build upon itself in any significant way while you are going through the story, and it is entirely possible to finish the whole game without ever learning any meaningful information about the world you are playing in. It's only through the player's own desire and investigation that the grand narrative can be discovered. 
Remnant Story is a continuation of another game, so the world reflects that through the established atmosphere and setting. The events that led to this place being in the state that it is in have already happened. We play the role of an outsider, someone who has no idea what has been going on. This gives the player an understandable reason for not knowing much about the events that have transpired, and an opportunity for the story to fill in those details for you without it seeming like forced exposition. This is a good setup, but despite it, the game does a fairly poor job of delivering the information to you. This is mainly because Remnant's story is told almost entirely through secondary sources. And it's done very poorly. Most of the lore is hidden behind item descriptions, in journals and notes, in computer terminals which are spread throughout the different locations. This in itself is not a bad way to tell a story, but the way Remnant teaches players of this resource is poorly implemented from the get-go. The first room you wake up in inside Ward 13 has no visible difference to any other room in the game. On the other end, opposite the way that you are meant to go, is a journal which has a considerable amount of exposition that is delivered from a first-person view. This teaches the player two things. One, there are these types of items in the world that you can find and that provide you with further context to the story you are playing. This is good. Having this lesson imparted in the players from early on is a solid way to communicate that there is more for you to find and learn about than just what the main story presents. 2. These items will most likely be in places you have no real reason going towards. This shows that if you want to learn more about the story, the game is going to make you go out of your way to find that information instead of it being a cohesive part of your journey. This setup is not only a weak indicator of what sort of story experience you will be in for, it's completely misrepresenting what most of your lore-related experiences will be like. One would expect for items of this sort to be placed in locations where a player can access them with a relative ease and consistency, so as to piece the story together as they go along. Sadly, that's not the case at all. There are only a few places other than War 13 where you can reliably find pieces of story stashed away. The rest of them are spread across the randomized environments in form of notes and item descriptions. Why this was done is beyond me, especially considering that every single world has at least two locations in it that remain permanent throughout every playthrough, regardless of changes. The devs knew that most open areas would be under the influence of random generation, so why would they choose to put the important parts of the story into these environments? Imagine how much more rewarding it would be to arrive at a new area if you knew that along with it came further information of where you were and why without an NPC having to tell you. You would be able to discover the story for yourself and create attachments and connections because you earned the information in a dynamic and cohesive way that was supported by the gameplay. For those that don't care and just want to run to the next boss, this would change nothing. It would even tempt them a bit to learn about the story in a way where they didn't have to sit through dialogue or a cutscene. Even if not for them, those players that wanted to follow along the main story with the supplementary reading could do so in an organic way that didn't require them to run multiple versions of the same level just to get a mostly completed picture of what was going on. Each landmark could have been a location to further expand on the information the player had. Adding to the knowledge gathered through items in the main story, it would create an even flow of exploration, exposition, and loot that cycled into itself and rewarded all kinds of players equally, evolving on the basic loop that the game does so well. The more frustrating thing is that they actually did this for the first part of the game and then sort of stopped. When you enter Ward 13, you find the first journal in the room. Then, you're directed to the lower levels, which are optional to explore, but reward you with plenty of information if you want to take the time to search about and unlock the little secrets it offers. You even get a fairly good sidearm for your trouble to incentivize loot-motivated players. And it's done in a great and organic way that allows you to choose whether or not you want to continue to the next area or stick around and look to see what you can learn. After leaving the ward, the next area you enter has a hidden room with even more information in the form of another journal, again supplemented by a set of armor you can find. New area, story, loot. These are great uses of design and story development which reward the player for being curious and wanting to know more about the world. They follow it up with a third journal at the end of the Earth Boss, the Root Mother, hidden in the back room of her church. Again. A place that is out of the way, but 
permanently in every run so it encourages exploration, but doesn't demand it. Do you see my point? They could have continued this trend throughout the whole game, but then they just stop. The last one like this comes from the journal found in the labyrinth and, and that's it. The rest are scattered in the wind. We could have had an appropriate version of the journals for each new zone and have been shown them in engaging ways that would not detract from the main path. For example, when we reached the monolith in Rom and unlocked the hidden room with the armor, they could have placed the Rom version of journals in here for us to find. Make it a tablet or something that's inscribed on the wall. This would have let players know what to look for in this part of the universe. It would also be hidden inside the puzzle room along with the armor so it would still be a rewarding thing to find that isn't just handed out to everyone. You would have to want to find it and the game would reward that desire. The rest could have been scattered across boss rooms across the story. This would keep the somewhat random element but would still let players know how and where to find a specific piece of information, even if it's guarded by a fight. Let's say that they didn't want to do the system, and in fact wanted to have a good portion of the world's information scattered throughout the randomized levels. I don't think this is the case, but let's just say so for argument's sake. There should be an in-game journal that kept track of the notes that you already discovered. If as a developer you insist that having letters in journals be a difficult items to find, items that require you to run multiple versions of the same area and look inside buildings that basically look the same, then you should not make your players have to do this more than once. A simple catalog of what the letter was, where it was, and what it said would have been enough. Without this, if you ever want to refer back to a piece of information in the world, then you better have taken a screenshot. This is such a basic, necessary requirement for a game that relies on this type of storytelling that it pained me from the first moments of my experience that it was missing. I'm still upset about it, but I guess it's not as bad as the characters. Despite the myriad of characters that you come across in Remnant, most of them are just mouthpieces for exposition or to get you to the next checkpoint. The world doesn't react to your actions in any meaningful way even through the main story quests. The NPCs have no response to what you've done aside from a few occasions in which they react in mild comments and then completely forget anything that ever happened outside of that one instance. This again only occurs in the Earth section of the game, and then it's completely absent. Yet another sign of a part of the story that was done well, but only in the barest of terms. It's like the devs finished the Earth section of the game properly, implemented good ideas for gameplay and story, and then once they got to ROM and beyond, they completely forgot how to game. I don't mean to seem like I'm attacking them, but there's such a clear disconnect between the first levels and the later ones that it's baffling. Even when drastic, life-altering events occur that impact specific NPC storylines that we've been following, the characters themselves can't be bothered to react in the slightest. The most egregious of these is the Ford family, who are central characters in the plot of the game. Really, the entire story and our purpose in it revolves around Commander Ford and his actions in the years leading up to Ward 13. We follow in his footsteps in a last ditch effort to remove the threat of the root from our world and save humanity. Pretty cool premise, and it instantly hooks you into this idea that Ford is this larger than life character that accomplished many things in his life. We speak to his granddaughter, his ex-wife, and a lot of early story revolves around his journey through the crystal. His life before and after the root invaded, and his guilt and self-loathing brought on by the events of what happened in the wards under his watch. He's a cool character. Then in the final act, we actually get to meet him. The ghost we've been chasing this entire time, fought countless bosses for, followed his words and message to do what is right and save Earth. Here. In this abandoned prison, a man who is seen as a myth sits broken. We speak with him eager to learn what he's done, of what his side of the story is, to learn the truth from the man who was there during everything. But instead he gives us a key and tells us to piss off. That's it. That's how our meeting with Ford ends in the base game. We can't ask him any questions about his life. We can't tell him about his granddaughter or how his wife became the root mother and she returned to the ward. We can't even really explain to him who we are. He doesn't care. He just gives us the key to the Aleph, wishes us good luck, and once you leave here, he's gone. Not back to Ward 13 or anything, just gone. We go on to defeat the dragon and the Aleph, 
in turn discovering that it was part of the route all along, and in doing so, we achieve our purpose for coming to this land. But who cares? It's such an incredibly frustrating turn of events for someone who is invested in the story. You've done this astounding, world-changing thing that no one else was able to accomplish, but no one cares enough to even comment on it. It almost makes me wish that we were the only survivor in this world and that the ward was empty of anyone else. That way, we only get to learn about these people through journal entries and stories left behind. At least then, it would make sense why there is no one reacting to anything that's going on. The DLC does this with a minor character that we learn about through entries. He's been trapped inside one of the rooms inside Ward Prime, and slowly we get to see as he devolves into madness. It's interesting. It's funny. I care more about him than any NPCs that I've actually met in the game. That's not how that's supposed to be. The base game ends and that's it. All you're left with is the knowledge that you did a thing and some items to represent that. The root are still outside, the world is still the same. No impact has been had. Despite what the last bits of cinematic try to tell you, you can't even talk to Ellen and tell her that we succeeded in the quest to find her grandfather. We end up where we've always been, our actions having had no real impact. The base game leaves the story somewhat open, though in reality it could have ended here. We're told the Root have been defeated at the Aleph and that the world can start to return to normalcy. Until we get to the DLC. From the start, this was marked as the final piece of content for Remnant. As the time of this recording, that still remains true and I have no expectations of a change. Subject 2923 is a moderate improvement on the formula the base game established and worked with. The boss design continues the trend of unique visuals that blend well into the world. Each one brings a new and challenging encounter to the roster, which was already respectable on its own. I mentioned this in my spoiler-free review, but Razum has some of my favorite boss encounters in the entire game. They each require a new level of player skill and adaptability to conquer, and many add dynamic new trials to their area in the form of environmental hazards. The added loot expands on the great mechanics that the game already has, and allows for interesting customization for new and old players alike. These are aspects that Remnant has always done well, and they continue to do so in their final piece of major content. The world of Razum is distinct in visual style and atmosphere from any other, and that is a welcome inclusion into the game. It adds a much appreciated aesthetic change through its use of limited weather effects and level diversity. Though the enemy design in the outer world remains largely the same from a gameplay perspective. I've covered a lot of my general opinions on this in the non-spoiler review, so I don't want to repeat myself here. The story follows the same general beats that the one in the base game does. This time we have to finish off the remaining stronghold of Root on Earth, removing the threat from our planet once and for all. In order to do this, we must find the dreamer that went missing during the first trials inside Ward 13. In short, we have to find someone more important than us so they can help us get to a place to kill a bad thing. It's the same story from the base game, beat for beat, only condensed down to fit a DLC. I do think that despite the thematic similarities, Subject 2923 introduces a lot of interesting and engaging elements to the story. The fact that they used Clementine as a primary focus was a delightful and unexpected surprise. She's barely mentioned in the base game, aside from a few entries inside the lower levels of Ward 13 a piece of information that many players could easily miss. There's no real inclination until quite a bit into the DLC that she is of any importance, and if you were one of the players who skipped out on going through Ward 13, you would have no idea who she is or how she ended up in Razum. This is a nice mystery to add that has actual answers to look for in the game. We follow her trail for a portion of her journey through Razum, eventually being pointed in her direction by one of the remaining friendly locals. Speaking of locals, this NPC made me so uncomfortable. This is the only time in the entire game that I've ever felt uneasy, and I could not tell you why, just listen to that. You can hear them suckling. Well done, Remnant. You creep me out. We eventually find Clementine in the company of the world's guardian. We come to learn that their connection has grown to such a degree that she has started to gain the abilities of a guardian and so she is able to repel the root. This is a massive revelation for the story. Not only is this the first time that we meet a non-hostile guardian, 
but the implications that a human with guardian powers has is absolutely astronomical. The game does nothing with this information and just puts it aside in order to get us to the final confrontation against the real last Root entity. If you follow the convoluted backstory of why Root came to Earth, you learn that Skarsgård was the lead scientist in the Ward Project. It was through him that the Dreamer Project was used by the Root as a gateway to enter Earth. He sided with them and doomed us all. He's also the final boss of the DLC, a mutated humanoid Root hybrid that sits in a sister dimension. With Clementine's new powers, we fight Skarsgård. The fight itself is not particularly impressive, aside from the fact that halfway through you gain a new weapon to use against him. This was a very cool moment seeing it for the first time through, but it quickly becomes a bit of an annoyance if you want to fight him with any other weapon than the one the game gives you at the time. Anything else you have equipped gets switched out, which I found to be very pesky. We defeat him and the game gets... <sighs> the real ending. So, we beat the big bad. The root are finally dealt with. Our long journey, all our trials and difficulties have finally come to an end. The road ahead is long and much must be done to bring back the world into a sense of normalcy. You return to Word 13, your head held high, victorious. All of your friends, people that have relied on your success to have a future, gather around you, happy and smiling. Everyone claps you on the back, the camera zooms out, and the credits roll. Yep. That's it. That's how the game ends. Did you want some sort of resolution to the events of the past? Did you want to speak with the NPCs that have been here from the start? Maybe learn about what they plan to do now that the danger is passing? Did you want to feel complete? Guess again, cowboy. Oh, hey, Ford is back. He's in the ward now. Let's see how he feels about returning to his proverbial home, where his family was created, where his daughter died and his granddaughter now leads where his wife stands literally a short walk away. What do you say to that, Ford? Good luck out there. Well, there you go. That's the end of the entire story. As I watched the credits roll, I felt a bitter feeling slowly growing inside me. This is a game that I love, that I have spent many hours with, and that I have a real investment in. And now it's over. There's always an inherent sense of loss when something you enjoy ends whether it's a game or any form of media. I'm a stout advocate of the idea that something should end well before it becomes a monster of meaningless rehashes and used up ideas. Endings are good. They give finality and closure to a story and allow the viewer to move on with a sense of completion. I don't think any person or group that creates something for the entertainment of others owes their audience anything other than their best work. Video games, like any medium, are subjective forms of entertainment and ultimately depend on the person experiencing them to dictate their value and quality. Despite everything that I've said here, I know that it's just how I feel and it can be different for someone else. But as I sat there watching the names of all those people that worked hard on this game, even as I sit here reading and writing this, I feel like this is not the best gunfire games had to give. I felt like there was more of a story here that they wanted to tell and were not able to. So they settled for any conclusion rather than the one the story deserved. And for that, I'm sad. It feels incomplete. It will always feel like this. There are so many questions still unanswered. Questions that have no real answer to find in the game world. The story itself isn't even over for our character because there's still so much left to do. It isn't as simple as, and then everything worked out. Remnant for me has always been a game that missed out on reaching its full potential as a story. There is much to admire here from the world design to the visuals to the lore and history presented. All of it had huge potential to be amazing, but we only ever get to experience a glimpse of that greatness, never the full thing. It's a sad moment for me when I see something like this and for a game that I have fallen in love with despite its broken corners and dented exterior. It pains me to have to say goodbye to it, without ever seeing it reach the heights that it could have. Sure, I can still go back and play through the levels and use the gear I've earned with friends, but for me, the story is what really captivated and enthralled me. It's the reason why I returned over and over, and 
there is no more left. Remnant is a beautiful and broken game, a clear work of love and effort from the people that created it, and almost masterpiece that still leaves me yearning for more and theorizing long after the last words have scrawled upwards on my screen. A beautiful mess, never to be mended. Hello all, if you made it this far into the video then I want to thank you for watching all the way through. You're an absolute hero. If you just skipped to the end, well, thank you anyway for clicking on this video. As always, I would like to thank my wonderful community for their support. If you'd like to get more involved and see what's in store for the channel, then subscribe and head over to our Discord. It's really starting to get fun in there. If you like the words that I said and would like to support future content like this, I have links below where you can do so. Once again, thank you all that made it this far, and I look forward to seeing you in what comes next.